Welcome to the Clutch Kitten Gaming Podcast, where I play an indie game for five hours and let you know whether or not it's worth your time and money. Hello and welcome everyone, this is James, also known as Clutch Kitten, and I am so glad that you're here for episode 34 of the show. I hope you all enjoyed listening to last week's roundtable as much as I enjoyed recording it. It's always such a fun change of pace, hanging out with friends, and just talking about gaming. The only bummer about recording those episodes though is that I don't get to shout out new 5 star reviews and answer your questions. So let's take a bit of time to catch up on each of those. If you've been hiding under a podcast rock for a while now and aren't sure the point of reviews, there are five. Shoot, I guess one downside to podcasting alone is that I have no one to laugh at my jokes. I'm just going to pretend that you were rolling on the ground laughing from that so I feel better about myself. Anyways, if you enjoy the show, one way you can show your support is by jumping over to iTunes and clicking that fifth star. I'm not actually smart enough to know exactly how this helps, but at the very least, it's an encouragement to me. This week we have two new 5-star reviews. The first one is from Frank the Destroyer, Winky Face, who says, A must listen if you're a fan of indie games or gaming in general. I love that James gives in-depth reviews of every indie game he covers. Also, his voice is very relaxing. Frank, that is super kind of you, man. I really strive to give quality reviews on the games I look at, so I appreciate that you enjoy my thoughts. Our second review comes to us from Mimi is the Coolest, who says, Love listening to his podcast. It gives me insight on new games and an idea of which ones would be worth buying and fun to play. Also, love his Instagram posts of the fur babes. Much thanks, Mimi is the Coolest. It's Always fun hearing from listeners who have downloaded the games I've recommended and learning about their thoughts. I'm assuming much like all of you, my time and money is limited, and so I always want to get the most out of the game time and money that I do have, so I'm glad that my insights are helping you figure out which games are worth buying. In addition to Frank and Mimi's incredibly kind words, I received a few questions on Instagram that I thought would be great for the show. The first is from Strilly Vanilli, who says, How much of your time does one of your podcast shows roughly take? Dennis, that's a great question. In my mind, the time is primarily made up of prep, at least for the normal episodes. Assuming that the game isn't incredibly short, that's five hours of time. In addition to that, it takes anywhere between two and four hours to actually organize my thoughts and research for the show. Once all the prep is done, it generally takes me between 40 minutes and an hour and a half to record and then about another hour, hour and a half to edit. Obviously, all these elements are variable in nature depending on how focused I am, as well as how complex the game is. So for example, the episode for Tooth and Tail took quite a bit longer to prep than the episode for What Remains of Edith Finch. Today's second question comes from Sofa Gamers, who asks, have you ever thought of doing a retro indie game analysis for the podcast? This is another great question. I basically took it to ask if I'm ever going to review older indie titles. The short answer is that I would love to, but I probably only will if I get more time to spend on the show. With my current format of one episode per week, I see my priority as being recent games, or at least ones that have come out in the past couple of years. That's kind of the arbitrary number that I put on it for myself. However, if I do get the chance to do two episodes a week, or possibly add a section onto the current show, I think some retro reviews would be super interesting. For now though, I kind of see my roundtable episodes as being my outlet for talking about the games that have been out for a while, such as Stardew and Transistor. Thank you both for those awesome questions. For the rest of you, if you have a question, game, dare, or comment about the show that you want to send my way, you can either email me at clutchkittengaming at gmail.com or shoot me a DM on Instagram at Gaming. Let's take a moment now to talk about some incredibly exciting news. As you're all quite familiar, I'm a big fan of indie games. I I think that's pretty safe to say. However, I do still enjoy breaking out the AAAs on occasion. I love XCOM 2, Borderlands is great, and like most people, I love the classics, Mario and Zelda. That's what makes this news so cool. 
If you haven't already heard of the indie studio Brace Yourself Games, you've probably heard of their hit game Crypt of the Necrodancer. It's an award-winning, hardcore, roguelike, rhythm game which I haven't actually played but I've heard great things about. Now here's the kicker. The indie studio, Brace Yourself Games, has teamed up with the not-so-indie Nintendo to release the Crypt of the Necrodancer sequel called Cadence of Hyrule. This sequel will have Link and Zelda as playable characters, 25 remixed classic Legend of Zelda songs, and a whole lot of other Zelda stuff mixed into the Necrodancer universe. Apparently it's supposed to release this spring, and I am so excited. Not only does this game look amazing, it's super cool to see Nintendo trusting an indie studio to use the revered Zelda IP in their game. There is no doubt in my mind that this game is going on the docket for an upcoming episode. If you haven't watched the trailer for this game yet, make sure you check it out. It looks and sounds wonderful. Let's move on now to this week's game. Today we're going to be talking about Flipping Death. I know it's a flipping weird name, but once we get into the narrative and gameplay, I think it will make a lot more sense. Flipping Death doesn't quite fit into one genre in particular. Instead, it's a unique amalgamation of a puzzle, adventure, and platformer game. It was released on August 7th of last year and is available on Switch, Xbox One, PS4, and PC for $19.99. It was developed by Zoink Games, which is an indie studio based out of Gothenburg, Sweden. Zoink was founded by Klaus Lingold, who's a veteran of the industry, and since starting the studio, they've released games like Stick It to the Man, Zombie Vikings, and Swing King. According to HowLongToBeat.com, Flipping Death takes anywhere from 5 to 7.5 hours to beat, and in terms of controls, you can either use gamepad or mouse and keyboard. I personally played this on Switch, and using the Joy-Cons felt more than adequate. One thing I will say though is that the actual feel of how the characters move in this world was different from what I was expecting. Due to the level design there is some platforming, but it's far from the focal point of the game, and it's incredibly forgiving. All that being the case, your choice of controller really isn't too critical to your enjoyment of the game. Let's move on now to the narrative. Holy hell, what a day. Old people are so dumb. I got fired from my job for making a frankly hilarious joke about death. I mean, her husband did just die, but come on. It's nearly Halloween people, and of all the days, a few weeks before Halloween should be the one where it's okay to throw in a little bit of dark humor. What's crazy is that getting fired wasn't the worst of it. I decided to hop in the car with my boyfriend and go on an adventure, and of course make out, and what do you know? A freaking tree got in the way as I was trying to dodge a critter on the road. Thankfully, we were both okay, and it turned out that we crashed near a spooky cool cemetery. How eerie is that? The bummer thing is that my bad luck hadn't run out yet. I was merely just peeking into an old crypt when, crash, I fell to my death. You might be wondering how I'm even talking with you now? Well, that's what's insane. Dying wasn't even the craziest thing that I had to deal with today. Flipping Death revolves primarily around Penny and the cast of characters in the small town of Flatwood Peaks. What I didn't mention in that opening monologue is that after Penny dies from her fall in the crypt, she finds herself in the land of the dead, which is sort of like Flatwood Peaks except with ghostly people and a much darker visual palette. After a misunderstanding and a half, Penny ends up being the replacement for the character Death while he takes off on vacation. Thus begins your journey, and thus begins our analysis of the narrative. Let's start out by looking at the narrative framework that Flipping Death builds. This game is assembled in an episodic fashion, a little bit like a TV show in the way each episode or chapter has its own unique story beats while carrying on an overarching plotline. It's even more like a TV show in the way each new chapter changes up small details about the characters and the town. In one chapter you might find the doctor downstairs in the hospital, and in another chapter he might be upstairs in the hospital with a defibrillator. In one chapter you might find a barbecue and picnic table set up on the balcony 
and in another chapter, a magician's tent might be there instead. That narrative framework alone felt unique, but Zoink games really outdid themselves by filling in that narrative with engaging story beats and beautiful character development. I'm not going to get into details about that overarching storyline, since that teeters on spoiler territory, but I will talk about what I enjoyed about those smaller stories that were told. After Death leaves on vacation to the moon, you're basically left with his scythe and robe, with the task of dealing with people's problems in the underworld. You're essentially a glorified and goth babysitter. You wouldn't think that ghosts have many problems, but surprisingly they are chock full of them. One character died with her head on fire, but with no way to put it out in the land of the dead. A ghostly sailor is forever sad because he doesn't have the blue paint to make his boat beautiful again. The ghosts are full of odd problems that you have to address, and that's where the real world comes into play. Although becoming the new death isn't quite as hardcore as you might imagine, it does come with its perks. Not only do you get a scythe that lets you dash around, you also get the ability to possess living people. That ability unlocks the flip side of the land of the dead, which is the land of the living. We'll get into how possessing people plays out mechanically soon, but the point of bringing all this up is to say that Penny's ability to travel between two different worlds unlocks a shocking amount of narrative depth. The way things interact between the two worlds is super cool, and the interesting connections you can draw between the dead and living characters is so fun. The game also narratively encourages you to explore and take your time with each chapter. Although each chapter has clear objectives that need to be met in order to progress in the game, there's also a list of side objectives which unlock character cards if you complete them. I really love it when games are designed this way. If you're the type of player who just wants to mainline the game, you can absolutely do that. But if you're the type of gamer who enjoys taking your time with the lore and exploring, those side objectives award you with cards that add narrative flavor. The last main aspect of the storytelling I want to touch on is the writing. How the writing made the game feel really goes hand in hand with the voice acting and art, but we'll get into those aspects in a bit. The world that Zoink created, the dead and live versions of Flatwood Peaks, and the characters within them are so incredibly cool. And part of what makes the Flipping Death world come alive is that ability to possess people. Not only can you have conversations with people all throughout the dead Flatwood Peaks, you also get to experience the living Flatwood Peaks through various characters' perspectives. While possessing people, you're able to listen into their thoughts. You're also able to converse with them, but in more of a conscience sort of sense. They aren't aware of what's actually happening, so most of them think Penny is some sort of inner voice that they're talking with. This weird interaction leads to some incredibly funny dialogue sequences, especially since all of the characters are such exaggerations of different character qualities. You find out that the macho lumberjack is incredibly self-conscious. The fireman has an uncanny addiction to watching horror films despite having heart issues. And the old lady has a downright gross obsession with the younger, more attractive men who use her for her money. Despite this being a game revolving around death and possession, it has a very lighthearted and funny writing style. The two titles that kept coming to mind for me were Bob's Burgers and A Nightmare Before Christmas. In some ways, it felt like a twisted mashup of those two titles. I feel like I could go on and on about the narrative in this game, but the main takeaway is that the writing kept me engaged and entertained the entire time I was playing. We've touched on it briefly, but what are you actually doing in this game? Well, the main goal of each chapter is pretty clear. It's literally written out for you to see, but the actual process of completing that goal is much more complex. First of all, you can imagine each chapter game space as being a two-sided 2D diorama. One side is the dead side, with its own unique characters and details, and the other side is the living side, with its own unique characters and details. You start on the dead side, but as you explore around, you'll stumble upon ghosts and also shade-like beings. It's those shadow figures that allow you to possess a living entity and literally flip that diorama around so you're on the living side. What adds complexity to the puzzles is that there's some weird interactions that can happen between the dead and living worlds. Interactions that you will have to take advantage of if you want to proceed in the game. The second element I need to mention is what actually happens when you possess someone. 
When you choose to possess one of those wandering shades, the world flips and you take control of their body. In addition to being able to walk around and jump just like them, or in the case of birds, fly just like them, you also gain the ability to do whatever that character can do. For example, if you possess Pokeman, you have the ability to extend your arm to poke people at great lengths. If you possess the obnoxious teen with an ice cream cone, you can run around shoving ice cream in people's faces. If you possess the fireman, you can use your extinguisher to put out fires or cover other characters in wacky foam. As you might imagine, the possession mechanic is incredibly fun. Although the mechanical play of controlling characters is very simple, a huge part of the fun in this game comes from being a dumbass and running those characters all over the map to see how they interact with everything else. So how do these mechanics actually work together? I think the best way to illustrate this is with an example. At one point you need to get information from a specific ghost named Vera, but she will only give you that information once you find a way to put out the fire on her ghoulish head. As you start exploring the living world, the dots begin to connect. First off, you find out about that fireman who has heart problems and a hankering to watch the latest horror movies. Through a series of other events you trigger, a small girl ends up being covered in soot and has a staggering resemblance to the girl in that horror movie the firefighter is watching. You then possess that girl and run into the fireman's house screaming, which causes him to die, which causes his ghost to appear in the dead world, which obviously means he took his extinguisher with him to the afterlife, which means he can put out the fire on Vera's head. Wow, that's just one example of how these interactions work, and I didn't even tell you about half the steps I had to go through to even get to that point. What I love about the puzzle design overall is how satisfying it is. The solutions are clever and comedic, and the design lends to all sorts of playstyles. If you really aren't a puzzle person and just want to enjoy the story and wacky interactions the characters have, you can go into the menu for hints to guide you to the solution. If you're a puzzle mastermind, you can ignore those hints and figure out the solution by exploring the map and experimenting with different ideas you have. I can't tell you how many times I completed steps of the puzzle just by listening to a character's inner voice and doing random shit on the map. Although I love the gameplay overall, I do need to mention one aspect that I found to be disappointing, the platforming. The maps were incredibly well designed, but unfortunately I found the movement to be lackluster. As Penny, in addition to your basic jump, you're able to throw your scythe and dash to where it lands. Basically it's another way to implement a double jump. Although there were sections of the map where the scythe helped me move around quicker, the platforming just felt clunky. It wasn't precise, and in the few moments where I needed to platform quickly, it was just downright annoying. Thankfully, if you fall off a platform or mess up, the game doesn't punish you, but the slowness of movement was definitely hard to overlook. Now that we've discussed the narrative and gameplay, let's talk about the art and sound design. On the art side, this game is super funky. The description of the map being like a two-sided diorama was intentional because not only does that illustrate the flipping of the worlds well, it also illustrates what the art style is like. It's a 2D-ish game that gives some Yoshi's Crafted World vibes in the sense that it almost looks like something you could make out of real paper. The living side of the map is vibrant and has fun uses of perspective, and the dead side of the map is dark and ethereal, with portions that mirror or mimic the living side. The characters' mouths move a lot like the Canadians in South Park, if you're familiar with that. The mouths are more or less unhinged from the rest of the body, and kind of bounce around on the bottom part of the jaw while they talk. I think the kind of art style they went for was perfect for the game because it made exploring and experimenting in the world that much more hilarious. My description doesn't even come close to doing the art justice because it's so unique, and it does such a wonderful job of pairing with the narrative and writing style well. It's sort of awkward, but in an endearing way. This leads nicely into the VO, the voiceover work in this game. I loved how dynamic every character sounded. The voice actors did a great job of bringing life to the world and narrative, and even those characters with obnoxious voices felt tolerable because those voices matched well with the character's persona. To put the icing on the cake, the soundtrack for Flipping Death was a perfect match. Eric and Gustav composed the soundtrack, and it was full of some lovely jazzy tunes with trumpet, piano, and bass as some of the primary instruments. 
Some of the tracks made me think of the iconic Pink Panther song with some of those mysterious undertones. The music was upbeat and energizing, but it didn't get in the way of solving puzzles. It did a great job of balancing out the game and being the glue that tied everything together. Now that we've made it through the narrative, gameplay, art, and sound design, let's summarize with some positives and negatives. First off on the positive side, the storytelling was superb. The combination of excellent writing with quality voice acting made the narrative so captivating. Second, the gameplay was satisfying and fun. The puzzles were just hard enough to present a challenge, but not so difficult that I was spinning my wheels for hours on end. If I was even getting close to that, I could easily look at a hint as well. The possession mechanic was also such a standout element. Getting to embody so many different characters with special abilities and items made for a hilarious experience. Third, the art and sound design were top notch. Not only did it look good, you could just tell the artists had a lot of fun with this world. The passion for this game shone through in the detail and beauty of the art and music. And I know I'm kind of raving about this game, but I do think it's special that I could feel the energy the developers had. On the negative side, my primary complaint has to do with the platforming and movement. Like I mentioned earlier, it just felt clunky and imprecise. Luckily, the enjoyment of flipping death wasn't contingent on the quality of platforming, but fixing that system would have made the game feel even better. We've made it now to the final boss. This is the part of the podcast where I let you know whether you should slay the game and buy it, flee the game and avoid it, or farm up and wait for a sale. My verdict is to slay this game. Flipping Death presented such a refreshingly unique experience. Some games feel like they were developed just for the money, but Flipping Death truly feels like a passion project from some very talented individuals. It's fun, it's satisfying, and this game is just a joy to play. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to listen in. You are the ones that are keeping this show going, and I appreciate all the feedback and encouragement I've gotten. Don't forget to let a friend know about the show if you enjoy what you hear, and I'll see you in-game. 